drop the record on the turntable, put the needle on, starts with Detroit Rock City. I'm staring at the cover of the record. Here they are in costumes and makeup with the destroyed city behind them. And I'm looking at the Raspberries album, which I had next to it, and on the cover of that album, they're wearing leisure suits. So I'm like, game over, man. Hi, I'm Eddie Trunk. I started at Megaforce Records in 1986. I started a hard rock metal radio show in 1983, right out of high school. And a lot of people think it was maybe one of the first ever radio shows to focus on that genre of music. And uh, because I was doing this very unique radio show at the time, there was a guy who ran a flea market called Rock and Roll Heaven. His name is Johnny Z. I used to buy records from him and then go play them on my radio show, on my local radio station that I was on. And Johnny quickly realized that when I played records and talked about them, more people would go into his store and buy the records. So it wasn't long before he started saying to me, you know, hey man, don't pay for them, just take them and play them, because he wanted to, the sales. And, and it, was, it was a cool arrangement at the time. And he had said to me, I'll never forget, I had just started working in radio, early 83 and I'm doing my radio show and he knocks on the door to the radio station and th this radio station in Jersey it was in a house it was a good radio station it's still there WDHA but it was the studio was in a house on a highway it was not you know, on some building with any security or anything so I go to the front door and I, I look pull the curtain and there's Johnny Johnny Z from the flea market and I'm like uh, Hey man, what are you doing here? I'm in the middle of doing a radio show, and I was new to radio. I was real nervous, and he said, "I, you need me. I need to come in. I need to come in." And I was like, "What's up?" I got you. Can't. I'm, I'm in the middle. No, no. I, got, I need to come in now. And he had a bag in his hand, and he walked in the studio, and he goes, "I got this band, and I can't get anybody to play it. I can't get anybody to give this a chance on the radio. I just want you to play a song. I need to hear it on the radio." He said, "What is it, John?" I said, "Leave it. Let me listen to it. I'll let you know." No, no. I need you to do it right now pulls out of the bag a copy of the first Metallica album, Kill Em All. And he says, I can't get arrested with this band. I put everything possible, my life, into making this record and, and it being on my record label. And I can't get anything going with it. Will you please play it while I'm here? So I said, OK, what could it hurt? So while he was there, I played the record. I played the first song on the record. And he's like, thank you, man, thank you. And never forget, I still have it. He signed the record. And he write, you were the first man, thank you, you know. And when he left that day, he said to me, if I can ever get this band to take off, I'm gonna give you a job working for me. A few years later, I get a phone call from him and he said, okay, good news and bad news, what's up? He goes, well, Metallica's blowing up. I said, okay, what's the bad news? He goes, the bad news is they're leaving me because they're blowing up. So what do you mean? He goes, Electra Records coming and taking them over, because he managed them also. He said, Q Prime's taking them over for management, they're leaving. I said, wow, I feel bad, man, that sucks for you. He said, but the good news is, in the settlement that I'm getting because they're leaving, I now have the money to start a real record company, and like I told you, I'm making good on my promise, you got a job. So that's where my life started with Megaforce Records in 1986. Metallica, actually Metallica leaving, and I've told Metallica this, them leaving actually had a direct impact on my career. Inadvertently, they impacted my career tremendously because playing them early on and them then leaving Megaforce directly really related to me getting a job there. But the truth of the matter is, working in radio, in, even today, unless you're in a major market with a real good day part and a good following, you're not making any money. And radio, my whole trip in getting into radio was not to try to make money or to be known for it or to be a great broadcaster or anything. It was simply to take music that I loved 
and share it with other people. From day one, all it's been about for me is taking these bands that I felt have been marginalized and not given the respect that, they're just, that they should get and being able to show them in a respectful way to more people. So the greatest reward that I've had throughout my whole career, and it happens to this day, every day, is people come up to me and say, I know about this band because of you. Whether it's they read me writing about them, whether when I worked in a record store I sold them the record, whether they heard me play it on the radio for the first time, whether they've seen me on my TV show hold it up or tell them about it, that's what it's always been about. Ninety ninety one, there was a tide change, as everybody knows, in the type of music, and I was already being looked at as an A and R guy who was associated with the eighties, and there was an immediate stigma that came with that. And I was no dummy; I could feel the writing on the wall, and I knew that it was probably going to be hard for me to continue working in that in that business. Eighty seven, eighty eight, I had other record labels talking to me about working for them to sign bands. By 90, 90, 91, if you were a producer, A&R guy, anything associated with the hits of the late 80s, you were yesterday's music. The first time I recognized a change was happening was in radio. Having lived on both ends, the, the industry side, the radio side, the, the first thing I kind of noticed was the change in the playlist. What a lot of people don't know about radio, unless you do your own show and have a specialty show, you're told what to play. Almost every DJ anybody listens to in this country is told what to play, every single song. And we would get these computer sheets and all of a sudden I would start to see less White Snake and less Rat and less Def Leppard and less Bon Jovi and then all of a sudden, you know, these newer bands starting to pop in. All of a sudden, here's Alice in Chains. All of a sudden, here's Nirvana. All of a sudden, here's Pearl Jam. And instead of those bands meshing, and it's be like, okay, well, we're going to play Round and Round by Rat, and now we're going to play this new band, Nirvana. It was, it was. There was this feeling like, well, no, we don't. That's we don't do that anymore. We're this now. We're this, and we're seventies. This huge chunk of the last decade was just all of a sudden like, everybody kind of snickered at it a little bit. And it was like put, so it was a very sort of rapid change of these bands, just their, their names just disappearing on the computer printout when I would go into the radio station. And I couldn't comprehend it. I couldn't understand why, okay, why is this any different than, I understood that the music and the bands were different, but why can't they both coexist? But there was a very harsh, like, almost overnight, that's uncool, this is cool. I just look at it as it got so big, so quick, everybody started to look and sound the same. And I think that it was just, it got to be so over the top. And there were so many bands that were kind of redundant to the other bands that everybody said, it's, it's time for a change. And listen, it didn't help matters that a lot of those newer bands that were coming out, they had their fun dancing on the grave of those bands. They had their fun kind of taking shots at what they looked like and what they acted like and what they sounded like. So it was just kind of like, all of a sudden the troops were rallied and it was time to kind of shit on those bands. I'll never forget Klaus from Scorpions telling me not long ago that Billy Corgan came out as this huge fan of Scorpions. And Klaus said to Billy Corgan, he told me, uh, hey man, when we were getting destroyed and couldn't get arrested in the 90s and you were on top of the world, why didn't you say you loved the Scorpions? And he said that, that Billy Corgan said something to him, well, I couldn't say that then. Mirror, mirror, could you let me see? The things I crave and don't let me. Force it.